We turn now to ask, in what way is human language clearly different from other forms of communication among animals? All forms of life communicate. Trees communicate, bacteria communicate. Um, so what we're asking, is there any single feature that identifies human language as qualitatively different from other forms of animal communication? This turns out to be a very hard question to answer. Uh, some of the research has been done using great apes. And that down there in the right hand corner is Coco the gorilla, one of the apes so charged. Coco was taught American Sign Language, and yes, she is smoking. Um, some of this research has ethical problems. But let's start further from humans, and let's just consider the humble honeybee. Honeybees have some fascinating abilities, among them being able to communicate by performing a unique dance. It informs hive mates where a newly discovered food source is located. Every cycle of this waggle dance roughly describes the shape of the figure eight. Let's rewind and look in more detail. The bee only waggles on a part of its route, the straight run, indicated here by the waved line. The secret lies in the direction of the straight run, or to be more precise, in the angle between the straight run and the perpendicular, which in this case is 90 degrees to the left. This tells the other bees that food is available 90 degrees to the left of the sun. If the angle is 60 degrees to the right, they'll be flying 60 degrees to the right of the sun. That's a remarkable property that bees have evolved. It means that they can indicate using their bodies something, uh, information about something which is not present in the hive, something which is remote. Now, this arbitrary relationship between something here and something elsewhere is a characteristic of human language. And in fact, it's one of the most important characteristics. The relationship between the sound of the word horse, for example, and the animal it designates is arbitrary, it is defined by convention. And if we were to change conventions by speaking French, we would say instead cheval, or if we were to speak German, we would say pferd. So there's no obvious link, necessary link, between the form of the word and the thing that it designates. So this arbitrary relationship has been taken to be very, very important. We see shades of it in the honeybee, although the fact that there's a principled relationship between the form of the dance and the physical directions to be flown by the bees means it's not quite symbolic. But the honeybee dance is does display this feature, which is displacement. It's one of the very few forms of uh, animal communication where we can identify something which seems to be about something that's not present. We have no problem talking about our past summer holidays, fictional episodes, possible future scenarios, things that are very far away. And nearly all forms of communication among other forms of life are much more rooted in the present. They, it's possible to um, meaningfully interact with, about, with a dog about a bone that's present. But if the bone is not in the room, there's no way to indicate to the dog that you're talking about the bone. Another thing that human language does that might be kind of unique is that as well as, as it were, saying something about the world, we can also communicate how we stand to that state of affairs. So as well as saying the cat sat on the mat, we can say that Joe believes that he thought that the cat had sat on the mat. We can express things, we can qualify what we're saying with things like believing, thinking, hoping, understanding. And in this way, we can signal not only a statement about facts about the world, but also about how we stand in relation to those facts. And this introduces also the possibility of lying. That is, we can um, signal feelings we don't have, motivations, convictions we don't have. Now, deception is probably found among chimpanzees. It's not obvious that we can identify deception in all animals. So, that seems to be sort of special. One of the features that so excited the generative linguists is the generativity of language, the fact that most sentences are entirely novel 
and that although we have finite means at our disposal, we can generate infinite um, sentences as a result of this. So we have a finite bunch of rules and we have a finite set of words. The set of words that you command in a language can be divided into roughly two groups. On the one hand, there's a large number of content-bearing words like nouns, verbs, and adjectives. It's very, very large. And this set grows all the time. You still learn new words and we still invent new words. The word tweet didn't ex exist in the 17th century to describe a 140 character message on the internet, for example. Um, and then there's a smaller set of words which we'll just call function words. These include all things like the demonstratives, prepositions, conjunctions, and if, the, in, and so on. And this set of words are much less prone to change. They do change, but they change much more slowly and we rarely add something to them. So this ability to create an infinite number of sentences out of finite means is very important. And I say infinite deliberately because there is no longer sentence. If you give me a sentence, I can simply stick some words at the front of it. I believe I heard you say that and then repeat your sentence, and that's a longer sentence. So we can do that indefinitely. Let's just have a look now at one of uh, the animals, one of the apes who was taught sign language. This is Coco, who you saw smoking in the opening slide. And this is a transcript of the first ever live interspecies internet chat, back in the early days of the internet when people interacted solely by text, and you typed a question and well, the gorilla's not going to type an answer. I mean, then she never got that far. So um, her sign language is then interpreted by her minders, Dr. Patterson and others. So reading through all the comments here, we have um, someone asks, what are the names of your kittens and dogs? And Coco does the sign for foot. And Dr. Patterson says, foot isn't the name of your kitty. And so the person asks again, Coco, what's the name of your cat? And Coco says, does the sign for no. And Dr. Patterson adds, she just gave some vocalizations there, some soft puffing, and the person is very excited. I heard that soft puffing. And Dr. Patterson says, she's now shaking her head, no. Then the question comes, do you like to chat with other people? And Coco does the sign for fine nipple. And Dr. Patterson steps into the breach and tries to explain this away. Like, nipple rhymes with people. She doesn't sign people per se. She was trying to do a... I hope you can see what's going on here. There's an awful lot of wishful thinking on the part of the humans over-interpreting the signs of the gorilla in the hope that they might be make sense as human language. But wishful thinking has been a major hallmark of this kind of research. On the other hand, there are interesting... Um, examples from other animals, perhaps more distantly related to us, uh, a feature that we'll come back to again when we start to talk about um, animal brains. Um, so here in 2012, it was a remarkable year in current biology, one of the major biology journals. There were two articles that year about animals talking to humans of their own accord. This is Dr. Doolittle territory. It's very, very strange. One of them, which I don't have here, was a Korean elephant who was a domestic elephant, had been raised and worked, worked um, I think, in the lumber trade uh, all its life, and it had learned to respond appropriately to single-syllable Korean commands. And this elephant then developed an absolutely stunningly unique form of vocalization, never before observed and never since, in which it would take its trunk, curl it around and stick it down its own throat, and blow very hard. And this produced as a sound which it could modify with its mouth to produce intelligible Korean syllables. Context appropriate intelligible Korean syllables. So these were syllables it had learned in the course of its work and it was able to reproduce them in a context appropriate fashion. And that wasn't important enough. Then that same year there was a result uh, published about recordings made of a beluga whale, shown there in the image, imitating human speech. Again, we're dealing with an animal which was bred in captivity, was raised in, a, in a, an enclosure, had interacted a lot with humans, had obviously heard humans an awful lot. 
Now, belugas have really interesting vocal communication. I don't know if we should even call it vocal. They emit high-pitched squeaks and whistles. Um, they communicate comprehensively using these, but it sounds nothing like human speech. So it was very surprising when this whale seemed, as it were, to be making fun of its human handlers, more or less the equivalent um, of someone imitating humans going blah, 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 blah. All you do is blah, 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 blah. So let's have a listen to this. Now, the first thing to note is that is nothing like the sounds that belugas normally make. They make sounds which are much, much higher pitched, around 2000 hertz, and this is around 200 hertz. The second thing to note is, as a phonetician, this is a remarkable simulacrum of human speech. There are phrases, and the phrases exhibit a declining intonational contour, high at the beginning, dropping towards the end, and the phrases articulated into individual syllables. All of those are characteristics, universal characteristics, it must be said, of human speech and language. So this seems plausibly to be an animal imitating humans. Now, we have to be a bit careful. We like to hear such things. I'm going to finish up with an example that is not to be taken this seriously. And this is Hoover the Seal, who was very famous in Boston. He was a feature in the Boston Zoo, where he was reputed to speak with a Boston accent. And a Boston accent sounds like, Park and Harvard Yard. That kind of thing. Here's a little short clip of Hoover. I'm not convinced by that, to be honest with you. So when it comes to interpreting animal languages, we have to be careful because we are very much outsiders here.